Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, AME Lake Ontario Consortium's monthly deep dive session. Uh, I'm Richard Evans. I'm the consortium facilitator. Uh, and today's topic is a very special one, dear to my heart. Uh, it's all about two second lean, uh, a philosophy developed by Paul Akers and shared with the world in his book, naturally called Two Second Lean, how to grow people and build a fun lean culture. So I'm just gonna share with you uh, what today's agenda is all about. So why two second lean? Okay, so I'm gonna set the scene um, and then we're gonna get into some introductions with everybody. Uh, and then we've got some special guests today. Uh, Mark Braun from Cambridge Air Solutions, Eric Gilbert from Innova Fur Furnishings, Ryan Tierney from uh, Seating Matters in Ireland, Paul Akers himself from FastCap out on the West Coast in the USA, uh, and then Rick Black from ABS Furnishings. Uh, then we'll have a roundtable discussion uh, and then obviously conclude once we've done. So uh, this is today's agenda. And the reason for um, the session today is uh, because our consortium have accepted a challenge to adopt two second lean into their organizations. However, they're struggling to take that leap of faith to empower everybody every day to work on improvements. Okay, so have a look at our consortia. Just wanna show you the profile of our consortia. We've got six companies. Um, uh, there are some that are deeply engaged and there's some that have got so many issues that come and join us occasionally. So uh, CFN, uh, Jim is a general manager. Um, Tanya from Club Coffee is a CI champion. Uh, Graham from Richards Wilcox, a manufacturing engineer. Then we have Puyan and Fred from National Concrete Accessories. Puyan is the plant manager. Fred is the CI champion. And from We Are Esco, uh, Brad, who's the CI and HSE, Health and Safety and Environment Manager. And then from Ingenious Packaging, Lisa, Lisa Costa, who's the CI champion. So you can see from the profile that there's only a couple of people here that has the authority to enable major changes. Um, the rest of them need approval and they need support. And I was talking to Graham before we started and, and I was in a similar position uh, many years with my old organization where I was the CI champion and I was leading the lean charge and we did a lot of good stuff mainly because of the relationships that I had with all of the people in the company. It was a 600 person company and we did some fantastic um, changes. We actually got written up in Plant Magazine uh, of having a world-class 5S system, which was really phenomenal. Uh, I left the company in 2006. In 2007, their 5S program crashed. And it's purely for one reason, the leaders, the leadership in the organization was so um, traditionally ensconced in looking at numbers and fighting fires every single day, they couldn't see that getting everybody every day uh, to work on improvements was the key. So let's, uh, without further ado, let's get into some introductions. So what I'd like to do is for the consortium champions and invited associates to do that, give their name, company, role, and a very brief overview by each champion. And then special guests, just name, company, and roll over. So uh, roll only. So let's start with um, Jim at CFN. Would you like to introduce CFN, Jim? Sure. I can share this. Do you see my screen? We certainly can. All right. Well, good morning. and. Uh, to our experts there, I very much appreciate your uh, joining us today and giving us some guidance. Um, 
I'm the general manager at CFN Precision. Um, we are uh, part of the Sumitomo Precision Products Group uh, based in Japan. Um, we're a machine shop. We're a uh, machine to print. We make uh, landing gear components, uh, landing gear sub-assemblies, uh, primarily for the commercial market. Um, and our, we have a sister company uh, in Quebec uh, that does our processing for the most part, um, do all, all the uh, special processes and uh, coatings and grinding, et cetera, and paint. Um, we're located in uh, Toronto. We're actually in Vaughan, uh, north of Toronto. Uh, we say Toronto because nobody knows where Vaughan is. Um, we're, um, we were made in, uh, made, we were established in 1981. Uh, our plant's about 55,000 square feet. We have roughly 40 machining centers. Um, I mentioned we're part of the commercial uh, aerospace market. Um, we have our AS9100 approvals, uh, et cetera. Um, we make landing gear components, our primary part of uh, business. Uh, we make kits, um, we make sub-assemblies. Um, our market is basically to the three primary suppliers of landing gear, uh, Safran in Ajax and in uh, Europe, um, Collins Aerospace here in uh, Oakville, Ontario, and in the States as well, in uh, Ohio. Um, and um, uh, Haru DevTech in uh, Quebec and in um, Ohio as well. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I jumped ahead of myself here. So Haru DevTech, uh, one of our main customers, MHI in Canada, they make landing, uh, sorry, uh, wing, wings for uh, the business jets. Uh, we supply components for them, Safran, Collins, and uh, Sumotomo, we actually supply some product to our end customers. So that's what we do. Um, our lean journey has started and stopped over the years. Um, I'm trying to not be like Richard and walk away and, and it falls apart. Uh, interesting, I had a meeting yesterday and talked to some people that did a, a lean uh, training and um, guidance uh, about a year and a half before I started here and the report out was all great everything was good all these things were happening and when I started I didn't see a trace of it like not even one so I don't want to have that legacy I want this to stick so anyway that's all I've got okay uh, thank you Jim can can your team introduce themselves just name and role from CFN Kroom yeah, Krum Valkov, Manufacturing Engineering Manager, uh, nine and a half, so almost 10 years with the company. That's it, that's it, thank you. Just name and roll, <laughs> otherwise we'll be too long. Mark. Yeah, Mark Todd, uh, CFO, and I've been here about three years. Awesome. Who else from Gregory from CFN? Hey, Gregory Broxton, uh, Quality Manager from CFN. Anybody else from CFN? Yeah, Divyesh Patel, Production Manager. And Chris Taylor, sales manager. Awesome. Well done. Okay. Uh, Tanya, would you like to go next? Sure. Good morning. I'm Tanya Vanderplug. I'm the CI champion for Club Coffee. Um, you may have seen me at the AME conference a couple of weeks ago. I was a volunteer and had a great time. Came away super enthusiastic. Um, I'm going to share my screen as well. Give me two seconds here. Two seconds, Lean. All right, share, share, okay. Okay, can you see my screenshot or my, my screensaver in front of you? All right, awesome. Yeah, so I wanted to show, so there's my two second lean right in the center of my desktop. And it's too bad Ryan wasn't on because I think I took this idea about uh, bucketing my files from one of Ryan's uh, videos. So there's my desktop there. All right. I wanna give you just a bit of oversight about Club Coffee. Oh, I'm not getting video here, or sorry, sound. It's probably only music anyway, Tanya. Uh, there's some good history, but anyways, it's just a two minute uh, clip, a little bit about Club Coffee. Um, our company is, is 
was established more than 100 years ago. Um, so we've got some very entrenched, uh, you know, practices and procedures that we do. Uh, we've, we've certainly, you know, come a long way since, you know, early 1900. And you'll see that as we go through the videos. Um, we have two manufacturing facilities just north of the airport here in Toronto. One is a very old plant. The other facility is about six years old now, so very new technology. And I think our biggest challenge with implementing uh, lean has been the culture. So I joined the company in 2009, started a lean journey in 2010 under the guidance of a VP of manufacturing. Um, when he left the company a couple of years later, it died because lean was not bought in by top executive team. So a couple of years ago, I was offered the role of a CI champion. I took it and it's been great from a cost savings perspective. So really I'm focusing on Lean Six Sigma, doing a lot of cost savings initiatives, uh, which has been great when all I have to do is look at processes and are, am able to save money when we can improve a process. As soon as we get into working with people, uh, that's where the struggle begins for Club Coffee is really getting the employees engaged. And it's really at the mid management and the executive level to have the support. So. That's a little bit about Club Coffee. Awesome, Tanya. And you're flying solo today, aren't you? I am flying solo, yes. Yeah, because uh, the rest of your organization are doing peer reviews? Yes, we are. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, Kuyan from National Concrete Accessories. Morning. Um, let's share the screen here. Got to make sure I pick the right one. Um, so National Concrete uh, is a manufacturer and distributor of concrete accessories in Canada with one manufacturing facility just east of the airport in uh, Rexdale uh, or Toronto. And um, I'll just play this in the background while I'm talking. You can see I've favorited Brian and, uh, and Paul's uh, YouTube channels there. So I'm, I'm, I'm on there often enough. And uh, I'll play this. So we're essentially a machine shop and we have about 250,000 square feet of storage and facility and production um, floor space with about uh, 50 staff uh, on two shifts. We can, we can skip this boring part. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, our two second lean and, and continuous improvement journey started before me. I've been with the company five years and uh, just over three years with the manufacturing facility. So uh, we tried to pick it back up. It dropped off a bit. And with Fred's help as the champion, we've um, you know established a few few new initiatives. Uh, we dupli rob uh, robbed and duplicated something from CFN as well. So we're trying to um, you know take all the good examples and obviously learning from Ryan and, and Paul and try to really change the culture here at NCA. And um, so far it's going okay. Obviously it could be better, but that is where we are at uh, currently. Awesome. And uh, you got Fred with you today as well? He is, yeah, he's online, yeah. Fred, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Name and role? Fred Wong, uh, process engineer here at uh, National Concrete. And uh, CI leader, right? CI leader, 5S champion, you know, same thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Actually, it's 3S. It's not 5S. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, we have, uh, Ryan, sir, we have uh, Randy Bridge on as well. Oh, Randy yes, you got Randy. Sorry. sorry. Okay, Ms. Pullian brought me up. I'm the uh, scheduler. I've been with NTA for 15 plus years. I'm like a pillar in the company, but I am open to change, and it's looking good. Awesome, Randy. Nice to hear from you again. Good to see you. Yeah, for sure. Graham, RW Doors. Hi, I'm going to share my screen here. So we manufacture garage doors, um, big, small, pink, green, whatever you want. We'll, we'll manufacture it. We service the residential industry as well as the commercial industry. So on our residential line, we make doors as small as four feet by four feet. 
uh, to up to 20 feet by 20 feet. And commercial will will just about go as big as you want. <laughs> um, and that creates a lot of challenges for us, but we are working on streamlining our processes to handle a, a wider variety. Um, we're located in Mississauga, Ontario, and we have about 200, 200,000 square feet and 100 employees, most of which are general labor. In our peak season, we fluctuate a lot uh, based on temp workers. We hire on about 50% of our staff as temp workers, so we have about 50 temp workers right now. Um, and I'm, I'm a new hire. I was hired in September. I had done a co-op with Richards Wilcox prior to my hiring, but uh, yeah, I'm a recent graduate and I've joined their team. And uh, you're flying solo as well, right, Graham? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, it's hard to get management uh, on board with some of the changes um, that you know, honestly, just getting them involved is difficult. Everyone's so busy. Uh, apparently when COVID hit, everyone decided to renovate their garage doors. So we're unprecedentedly busy and people just don't want to stop doing what their normal routines are to take the time to try and improve the process, even though it'll help get more product out. It's a difficult thing to deal with, but. Yeah, that's unfortunate. And um, I mean, I know uh, the president, Dave, used to work with me uh, many years ago. Uh, he's, he's a very, very good leader, um, but unfortunately he's in the traditional world still looking at reports, trying to fight fires, uh, making sure that everybody does what they're supposed to do, but it, it's uh, it's not working. Garage doors um, are a very old industry. Like uh, our company's over a hundred years old, and anytime anyone makes a change, everyone else in the industry looks at them like they're crazy. So <laughs> it's difficult that way. Sorry. And uh, our last company, who's represented today, is uh, We're Esco. Sharon, you want to introduce We're Esco a little bit? You're on mute. Sharon. Okay. okay, I was just struggling to get it unmuted. <laughs> um, I'll just do a, a quick uh, video presentation from the system. I, I probably won't go through all of this. The trials and tribulations of virtual conferencing. <laughs> Is Brad going to join us today, Sharon? Sorry, no, Brad will not be joining us today. Uh, I won't bother going through that whole video. Oh, we're, we're, was anybody able to see that? No, you didn't share oh. your screen. <laughs> Sorry. Well, so um, ESCO is uh, about a 150-year-old company, uh, originally started in Portland, Oregon, uh, services mining, construction, industrial industries. It's uh, started as a, a foundry, still a foundry. We were purchased by Weir, a Scottish company, in 2018. Uh, we've started on the lean journey about 20 years ago. I've been with the company 23 and um, we're revitalizing the lean program right now. I'm a CI champion here at Weir Esco in Port Hope and um, the de facto lead for our 6S program and that is what it is right now. It is 6S, not 3S, but we are success. That's it for for us. Okay, and and it just reiterates the the struggles that our champions have. Um, they're all passionate. They all want to do lean. They all have drank the juice, but they're struggling. So the reason that we're here, obviously, uh, today, is to try and help them uh, a little bit. Okay, so if we have a look at um, our special guests, uh, just if you each could just introduce yourself um, only 
name, um, company, and role, what you are. So let's start with Mark. Yeah, Mark Braun, president at Cambridge Air Solutions. Thank Glad you. To be here. Eric. Eric Gilbert, uh, CEO of Innova Furnishings. Yep, thrilled to be here and impressed with everyone showing up. Excellent. Paul. Paul Akers, president of FastCap. And uh, joining us uh, in a short time will be Ryan Tierney, who's uh, one of the owners of Seating Matters, and Rick Black, who's a leader at, uh, I believe it's ABS uh, Warehouse Wholesalers as well. I've got a video from Rick, because unfortunately Rick couldn't join us today. So what I'd like to do is um, if we could get each of the uh, special guests, oh, I've got one more introduction to do if I could. Um, and that is uh, Kim. Kim Humphrey, are you on? Are you live? Kim? I am. All right, Kim Humphrey is is our president and CEO of AME. Um, share, learn, and grow is built into our psyche, right, Kim? Absolutely. And thank you for allowing me to join you today, Richard. Oh, uh, it's it's a it's a pleasure, actually, uh, Kim. You said the next time I got Paul online, please invite me. So I did. <laughs> thank you. And Richard, awesome. I've got a guest from Cambridge. Tony Spielberg's our manufacturing ambassador there and helps companies uh, take a look at what this looks like internally. So welcome, Tony. Oh, Tony, excellent. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So uh, let's just have a, a, a quick uh, look at the uh, agenda and the, the order that we're going to do today. So Mark, I'd like you to go first. Um, I'm only going to give you 10 minutes each. Okay, because I want to, there's a lot of questions, I think, that are going to come from the consortium members. And then um, the focus of what we want you to do is to say, what really triggered you to change? Okay, so what was the burning bush or the burning platform? Um, what did you do to change? What were some of the obstacles that you encountered along the way? And what are, what are the benefits of changing? So over to you, Mark, you're off and running. Well, it's great to meet everybody. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I have the honor of serving as the president of Cambridge Air Solutions. We're a family owned second generation business. And I was brought in, uh, joined the group 12 and a half years ago by an owner who had a vision and a passion for uh, building a growth based company that holds on to the family values. Um, and um, we actually, he, I remember vividly whenever he, I came in, he kept on saying, uh, he wanted to look at lean uh, as one of the 157 projects we had on our plate. And uh, I kept on saying no. I gave, I gave him a not only a little no, but a hard no. Uh, we had a lot of mess to clean up, and I didn't see lean as a solution to that. Um, I had learned early in my career that uh, engaged people doing incredible work together against a small set of strategic focused areas could move things. And so we focused there. And uh, the next year he said, I really want to, what about this lean thing? And uh, we were still working really hard to figure out how to run a business. And I didn't see lean as a, as an option, nor did I see it. I saw it as a complex system uh, of ways to minimize costs, eliminate waste, uh, increase margin, and we didn't have margin problems. We had uh, clarity problems. We had vision problems. We had all kinds of problems, but lean wasn't one of our problems. Uh, kept bringing people on and started to build and grow some, some health into the organization and really got alignment with the what I call carpet walkers. I've gotten that uh, term from the two second lean world. We got alignment in the offices of the people who dressed the same, looked the same, about where we were headed and how we were gonna build and grow. And we actually started making some real serious prog progress. We started to build sales. We started to build revenue. Uh, the profits dropped to the bottom line. And uh, every year, John, the owner would say, what about lean? Where does that fit? And literally, it, I didn't, it didn't make any sense to the, the leaders that we were bringing in. We were like, okay, that's not our problem. And so he did not give up. He kept on uh, doing it. And so if you have a hard-headed leader uh, like me, who's working really hard to build and grow with the skill sets that they know, 
and they're saying a hard no to you on lean, I can understand that. And uh, John didn't give up. He is a uh, beautiful hearted, uh, his vision is very high. And he ended up sending a couple of folks to see what two second lean looked like at Paul Aker's place. And uh, before they got back, they had sent a message back to myself and the COO, who were the two executives who were saying no to lean and said, I think this is it. This guy is awesome. This place is awesome. Everybody's engaged. Everybody's making improvements. Everybody's trying. And I know what that feels like. And I had the small team in the offices doing that, but out in the plant, it was still run traditional uh, command control. And I couldn't penetrate. I couldn't get, I don't know. I didn't know how to lead there. And so when they did that, we read the book before they landed on, on the ground in St. Louis. And uh, his concentration on keeping it simple, allowing people to engage with all their heart and the focus of lean being on growing people, not on increasing margin, on uh, ways to eliminate. That's not it. It's how do you grow people? And, and he gave a really clear articulated method to do that. So where we started from there was uh, the leaders came back and they said, we want the whole company to do this. Paul says, everybody has to do this. And I read on page 95, I think in two second lean, it says, start where you have authority to act. So we sat down with them and they did exactly that. They started where they had authority to act and they started making improvements and they started adjusting things and they started meeting and they started to gain traction. And uh, that was five and a half years ago. Um, from that time, we have uh, built an organization from top to bottom where every single person is engaged, not just the carpet walkers and not just the plant workers. I love the, I mean, what, what a cool word for I mean, like office. We, we want one team all focused, all forward. Um, and so today we have rhythms that are stolen right out of the book. And we have a morning meeting every single day, which you guys saw and were part of. I didn't want to miss that meeting for this meeting. So I had two Zoom meetings going. And I got to hear Meredith, who is a new employee, just joined the team a year ago and she stepped into leadership and she led that morning meeting. I didn't want to miss it for you. So I got to hear her share we got to see her grow in front of my eyes. And uh, the growth of our company is tied to the growth of every single individual. And for me, that's, that's, what, we're, that's what we're doing. Uh, everyone knows that lean is about growing people. Nobody has a question about that anymore. And everybody who joins our team knows that too. But the people started where they could start. Uh, and they made the changes that they could make and they gained influence and uh, then, it then it took over the entire uh, plan. It is our foundation of what our lean and improvement systems look like. Um, I wanna share with you um, what I believe and I, I wanna offer an invitation because the only thing that changed crazy people like me who are hard headed was to actually see it. Our people went out and saw it so I don't think teaching it can do it. I don't think uh, talking about it can do it. I think you actually have to see it. And um, I'm not going to show you our two second lean videos. You guys have all of those and I know that. But I, I want to show you um, what our company does. And I want to, at the end of it, this is a video that just got put together by our team. It's only been seen a couple of times, but it's basically what we do. And it integrates an invitation to you to come see us. And we've got Tony Spielberg on, who is our manufacturing ambassador. We believe this is actually our purpose, which is to enrich the quality of every life we touch. And we believe that uh, you're inside of that. We want to make that invitation. So it's a five minute video. Paul's going to say it's too long. I agree, Paul. But I also want to share it. And I want, uh, I want you to see it. So here it goes. We know that leaders like you face challenging decisions every day. Understanding the risk of investing or the risk of not investing in people, 
facilities, or capital equipment may be the difference in winning or losing in your business. We are committed to helping leaders like you create healthy work environments for your hardworking people. As a manufacturer of semi-custom HVAC equipment, we understand this risk because we face the very same challenge. Cambridge exists to glorify God by enriching the quality of every life we touch. And the services we provide manufacturing and warehousing leaders is all about helping you to enrich the lives of your people working inside industrial facilities. We strive to make the products and services we provide align with our why we exist statement. There are tremendous physical health benefits for bringing in fresh outside air into your facility. Your people perform better when their bodies receive fresh, clean air. Your facility processes, including compressors, ovens, forklifts, and exhaust can hurt your healthy work environment. Partnering with Cambridge Air Solutions is more than buying a heating and cooling system. We are all about creating solutions that work for your unique facility. We are not a high pressure global conglomerate looking to sell you some off the shelf option. We are a family owned second generation business in St. Louis that believes in creating environments where employees are safe, energized and productive. From design analysis through production and shipment and finally installation and startup, you can expect an extraordinary Cambridge Air Solutions experience. Whether you're seeking ventilation-driven cooling, heating, or air load balancing for process exhaust, Cambridge has multiple platforms that are ideal for improving working conditions for people. With an eye on providing thermal comfort for workers, we also help you by providing the most energy-efficient operating platforms available in the HVAC industrial segment today. Manufacturers have asked us to help them deliver cooler indoor temperatures for their people. Our two-stage evaporative cooling technology delivers fresh air to workers and uses the very same fresh air to cool workers inside the facility. This system operates at 20 to 30% of the cost structure of the most common commercial direct expansion cooling system with compressors. When you as a facility leader can deliver a 75 degree inside leaving air temperature when it's 95 degrees outside, productivity, recruiting, and retention are all improved. We want to eliminate your risk. For nearly six decades, we have been serving leaders in manufacturing and warehousing with our offering. We want to help you make the decision to enrich the lives of your hardworking people. Come see us, connect with us for an hour in a live or virtual tour, and see for yourself what a difference a unit produced by our greatest thinkers and our lean workers can make for your greatest thinkers and your team. A Cambridge Air Solutions tour is the perfect way to experience the difference for yourself. We will create a one-on-one -on -one experience led by a Cambridge Regional Manager. Our commitment is that this time will be dedicated to you and your team. We'll discuss those things that are most important to you in considering an investment in your people and your team's productivity. We look forward to meeting you. So. You know, I think the, the key for me on the end of that, first of all, I, Paul, I would love for you to cut that down in time. Um, but the, um, the key for me in that is that all of our systems, all of our processes, everything relies on our ability to grow and build people. Uh, our products are aligned with that. Everything is working towards that. The last thing that I'll, I'll share, uh, because I know I'm out of time, is that I don't believe that you can convert by going back and showing them that video. I don't believe you can convert a leader like me. I'm too hard headed. And so if you have a CEO or a president or a COO that's hard headed and you want to convert them, I believe the only way to do that is to actually show them and let them meet and see someone doing it. So I would be happy to share 
uh, would love for them to come and see it in action, whether it be at Paul's or Eric's or mine or wherever it is, there's places around the world uh, following the simple principles laid out in Two Second Lean, but we would be happy to have you there. And Tony helps uh, manufacturers do that. So thanks. Mark, thank you. Um, I, I remember watching a, a video that Paul did, I think it was American Innovator a number of years ago at Cambridge. And um, one of your managers on the floor was being interviewed and said basically that your employees spend close to an hour a day working on improvements. So their, only yeah, their whole job is to improve their job, not do their job. Um, right. But they, we have a dedicated time of 15 minutes every day. That's the morning meeting that is to grow each individual inside that meeting. And so there's all kinds of opportunities in that time to grow, including Meredith leading it. And then yeah. we have 30 minutes set aside for continuous improvement where every single person is dedicated time to actually doing that. It's called lean and clean time. And everybody knows about it. It's a daily habit. The problem, Richard, is that this isn't the group that needs to be converted. And so no. um, everybody should know that Richard used all of his leverage to get Paul, Mark, and Eric on with you because he cares so deeply that you guys actually succeed. And I don't believe that you're gonna be able to convert your leaders. It's not for your, it's, it's really hard to do. But if they, they can be converted, if they see it, that's my one statement is uh, show them. In, and use all of your leverage, just like Richard Le used all of his leverage to get that exposure to happen. Mark, thank you. Okay, um, next up, Eric from ANOVA. Okay, Eric, you've got uh, 10 minutes. I'm gonna give you 10 minutes, see how we do, go. Good, uh, yep, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, and thank you all for, for showing up and taking interest in this. I do think it's a, uh, um, just an incredibly valuable way to run a business. Um, I'm going to take a different tactic. I don't have slides. I don't have video. I've got none of that. Um, and I think I'm going to just try to tell the story of like my experience in this organization and we can get into questions later. Um, I, I agree wholeheartedly with everything Mark shared, especially, um, you know, this last concept of your job is to improve your job. I think that's a really important like root concept that is very, very difficult to get across and out into an organization. Um, I also think the idea of seeing seeing this in action is the difference maker. Um, I'll get into the details, but I, I've led our organization since 2011 and had a strong leadership role in it since 2006. And until I was able to get my team to Cambridge and see their morning meeting, I wasn't able to get this out into my organization. It, you know, it, it took us going to that and me turning to my team afterwards and saying like, guys, this is what I'm, I'm shooting for. Like we can have this, right? Like I, I just, I wasn't able to create it on my own. So, so seeing it in action, I think is incredibly valuable. Um, so with that, so I'm the, um, I'm the CEO and owner of uh, Anova Furnishings. We make uh, durable commercial grade furniture. We sell it um, and ship it all across the, the United States. Uh, been, been at it for 50 years, second generation, leader um, in, the, I think one of the most interesting things about this, at least when I, cause I've spent a lot of time thinking about this and looking at it. So my father uh, took us through an amazing lean transformation in the mid nineties. He started in 95. Um, that's where we have like all the amazing stats. We went from, you know, a 12 week lead time to a two week lead time in picnic tables, uh, which was completely unheard of in the industry. We probably cut our inventory at the time by something like 50 to 75%, you know, piles of cash going to the bottom line, all those like, all those great stories. Um, in 2002, right, right around the, like right after the kind of dot-com bust, um, there were some challenges in our business that weren't readily evident. Um, my father was starting to back out of the organization. We hired a very, very strong financial leader. Um, he essentially looked at all the numbers and said, look, you have all these people in meetings, they're going to these meetings, these lean meetings, there's nothing coming out of it. We're not seeing efficiency grow. We're not seeing, uh, you're not seeing anything like really strong happen. Like, why don't we just put them to work, right? How about, we, how about we quit just putting people in rooms talking and not getting anything done and put these people to work and get some product out the door. You know, in the face of, uh, you know, falling profits and, and like the challenge to business, that can sound pretty good, especially to a weak leadership team that's not like willing to stand up and say, 
lean matters, people matter. And so that was, I was not leading the company at the time, right? I was probably actually reporting to that gentleman at the time. Um, so great. So we got rid of lean and we probably got some more stuff out the door. Um, what I came to realize and one of the biggest blockers to lean and one of the things that I think is very painful, but I'm gonna just share with the team outright. Like um, what I came to recognize in this gentleman was he did not believe in people, right? Like fundamentally he believed that he had the answers and I'm, this is, harsh and I even hate to say it, but he felt like the, the, you know, the factory team, they're stupid. They didn't know he could go in and solve every problem. And, and like, uh, it took me a while. Right. But eventually things worked out. I led the company. He exited. It's probably one of the hardest transitions of my career. Um, and, uh, but, but fundamentally like lean was never, ever going to happen with a leader who, didn't believe that people have the answers, that every individual like has the talent and the, the, the inherent ability to just grow and do amazing work, right? And like, I think like everybody that Richard has asked on this call just takes that for granted. And I gotta tell you, if you're listening to this and you're working for somebody and you see it, you know in your heart, like if you're working for somebody and they're making like weird backhanded comments about the people that work for you, it happens. And if you're working for someone like that, you got to think twice about implementing lean. You got to think twice about where you are. Um, and I, I had the good fortune to be able to, to change my circumstances. But if you can't, like, I can't encourage you to like push lean into that. And so that's just one of the biggest learnings I've had that I think is really important. If you don't control the space and that's, who's, that's who you're working for, if they're not believing in people, think hard about it. Um, all right. Make that we want cancer. You should work for somebody else. You should leave. Um, anyway, I was able to make that transition. And then I struggled for like nine years because the model that worked in our organization was absolutely top down, right? My father, he brought in a killer consultant. Um, we, our backs were against the wall. The team believed it. The consultant's work worked and everybody like grabbed all the tools, spaghetti diagrams, process flow, Pareto, like all the sticky notes, all the, uh, all the hours of, of, um, you know, analysis that then can generate amazing returns. And like that all worked and it worked for us. And I, I absolutely believed in it. And I, I actually used the same consultant because he was a really good guy. Uh, and, you know, he still is fantastic at his job and, um, you know, great conversations with him, great understanding of where we wanted to go. And, uh, and I tried to use him uh, probably twice, like two pretty big uh, consulting engagements um, with a remote facility in Minnesota. I, I'm not there on, on the floor. Um, I, I have trouble uh, moving it and changing it from a distance. So, you know, on two, two occasions, like big multi-month uh, implementation efforts, uh, like long story short, they both failed, right? My, my leader there um, kind of checked the boxes while we were in there. I wasn't able to, you know, kind of press it through, um, turned over a couple different leaders in that space. Uh, and then um, you know, kind of making a bunch of long stories short here, still trying to grow the business, still working and, uh, and growing and closer to my, my sales team. Well, uh, we started running hard on another sales channel and that worked. And so in 2018, we had a wall of sales that we were facing and, um, and we had to figure out how to get it done. And so thankfully an advisor had put two second lean on my desk and my team's desk, uh, a number of months prior to that, uh, my CFO read it. He's like, dude, you got to read this. This is a new CFO at this point. <laughs> so, uh, so I read it and I was like, I was a hundred percent bought in, right? Like the moment, like a couple, you know, a couple pages into the book, it's like, oh my God, this is absolutely the formula I've been I'm looking for because I fundamentally do believe in people. Um, and, uh, and, and the other piece of this is like, I, I believe that waste is inherently bad, right? And when I see people wasting time, I see it as wasting life and it, it bothers me. It makes me uncomfortable. Um, and so, so two second lean was like a way to unlock that and to just make it clear to everybody, Hey, we can do this. We just need to give you the keys, right? Give like that lean and clean time, which is like, we empower you. We trust you to go fix these problems. Um, that was, you know, you, you talk about like, what's the trigger, right? That was the, that was the trigger for me. It was like, this is what we, this is what I've been trying to help people understand and just haven't been able to find the words or actions for it. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, as I started this, like kind of consistent and at the same time as that, we found Mark literally down the street um, and 
wandered in for a morning meeting and we were really off and running at that point. So um, we adopted two second lean morning meeting, uh, 30 minutes of lean and clean time. And, um, and, and it's been good. Like it's been a good couple of years. Um, the interesting thing is like, we have, we have a lot of challenges in this business. Like, I'm not going to like, I'm not going to sugarcoat that. So when I think of, you know, um, Richard was asking for like highlights. Well, the, the best highlight I, I'm happy to crow about is our safety record has turned around completely. We strung together, you know, a year without um, injuries and like, we feel really good about that. But, you know, our, our profits are still a little challenged, right? Like our, um, our quality, like we're still working on it. It's made great strides and great improvements, but like, uh, you know, I don't have like big stats and numbers, but our culture, right? People's desire to work and put time in against the organization and be here and show up and try is in a different space than it's ever been in the decade I've been, decade I've been, and I've been running this. And that is attributable entirely to two second lean, right? I have an engaged team that I can work with and point in a direction and we can go somewhere and I'm confident we can. And before two second lean, I didn't have that. I was kind of at the, at the market's mercy and trying to figure stuff out and floundering around. Um, so that's, that's what it's meant to to me and to our organization. Um, I think just some kind of interesting highlights, just other things that, that I wanna kind of share. Um, one was just the, the value of tools, right? I love tools, I love process flow diagrams, I love spaghetti diagrams, I love the analysis, I love the, like the, those hard numbers and figures. And, um, and uh, at times, like my team will kind of pull those tools out of the woodwork, right? So it's like, oh, we, they run into this problem and people are asking for, how do I solve this problem? How do I say, well, here's this tool, here's this tool. And the thing I found incredibly fascinating about Two Second Lean was at one point I pulled a process flow diagramming tool off the shelf, got a team together. I'm like, here, we're gonna use this. And we got like two hours into it. And I was like, holy crap, we are burning so much time. Like you guys know the answer, like figure, like we're done. Like I, I literally shut it off, like probably a third of the way into the process. Cause it's like, what are we gonna do? We're gonna spend two thirds, like we're gonna spend three times more time going after answers we already know, like the quickness and and um, just power of empowering people to move is just, I think it's it's super exciting. Um, and and I, you know, so it's, it's easy for me to get behind. Uh, the, the other thing was really also uh, th that I wanted to share was this idea about getting people into a growth mindset or a growth mode. Um, and as they're making improvements, I think one of the things uh, the top-down approach, oh, time, thank you. Yep, I'm close. Um, the top-down approach, uh, it's really focused on what the business needs, but what the business really needs is people to be engaged and excited. And so if somebody makes an improvement that isn't exactly what the business needs, but they are excited and ready to go to find the next improvement, that's the most important thing. That's the framework and the, the foundation that you need for going forward. Um, and so holding back when somebody brings an improvement and it's, you know, it doesn't directly impact the customer, but they are excited about it, helping, uh, you know, be excited with them and drive that forward and keep it in front of them. That's what two second lean and the daily, the daily habit of, of morning meeting does for us. I'm just gonna like tap out at 10 minutes and look forward to taking questions. Awesome, Eric, thank you so much. That was so uh, invigorating to, to listen to the struggles that you had with a leader that obviously looked at the numbers, very, very traditional. So um, it took you a while, obviously, and a, a hard transition to, uh, to overcome it. Uh, yes, I've got some questions, but I'm gonna leave them till a little bit later. Uh, Ryan, welcome. Thank you. You gotta unmute if you can. He's uh, sitting hey, in his car in the parking lot at the Hi, hospital. Everyone. Oh my gosh, um, dedication and passion. It's uh, so nice to see you again, my friend. Um, you just share with us your story of, of seating matters. Uh, what was your aha moment? What was the situation um, when you obviously took over and you know share what you did looking at Paul's video 20 times that night, <laughs> okay? Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And uh, hello to everyone. Sorry, I was late to the call. So I'm Ryan Tierney uh, from Seating Matters. Uh, we're uh, from Northern Ireland. We manufacture specialist seating for hospitals and nursing homes. Um, I'll just keep this really short. We'll go back five years. 
five years ago, our business was really struggling. Uh, orders were going out late. Our staff turnover was through the roof. We had loads of defects. The place was really dark and gloomy, and it really wasn't a nice environment for working in. And I went home one night, and I got my iPad, and I was sitting at my kitchen table, and I said, there has to be a better way. There has to be a better way. And I just type, started typing into YouTube how to run a factory, how to organize a factory. And lo and behold, Paul Akers came up on YouTube. And I'm not exaggerating, and, and I've, told, I've told Richard and Paul and Mark this story a few times. I actually sat up all night and watched the videos all night. I didn't go to bed that night. This was just a light bulb moment for me. And I, I just couldn't believe that a company could operate like FastCap. I was totally blown away. And it just lit a fire in me that has never went out. And that, that's coming up, coming up in five years. So I think it takes this passion. It takes the leader at the top. And I'm going to cut straight to it. If the leader or high-level management doesn't get this, I'm sorry, but it, it probably won't work. And I'm going to be very direct and very honest, honest when I say that, because it is hard work. It's really hard work. So back five years ago, I came in the next day and I said, everyone, we have to watch this video. It's two-second lane, Paul Akers. We're going to do this. And I just made a decision. And I, I remember Paul Akers telling me that the, the, meaning, uh, the, the meaning behind decision is to, inci or to cut off. And from that moment on, I said, we're not living. We're not working in the past. This is our new direction. And Two Second Lane totally transformed our company. I just, uh, I, I just can't explain on this call how much of a transformation that has been. But we've had over 200 companies uh, through our facility to see what we're doing. We've had people from all over the world coming to see how we've transformed our company. And it's all down to the teachings of, of Paul Akers. And I'll be eternally grateful for, for the teachings of, of Two Second Lean. Um, I, I would say that out of the 200 companies that have came to see us, I would say 15 or 20 are doing it at a, at a really high level. And that, that's not a good percentage. Because as Paul would commonly say, lean is for 2% of the population, 2% of companies. To, you know, to, to operate, it. some people try it and dabble in it, but the way we do it at Seat Matters, we, it's, it's, we eat, sleep, and breathe it. It's, it's all we think about. We're first and foremost uh, process engineers. We're there to improve the process of manufacturing chairs. We're not just there to manufacture chairs. And this, this shift is massive, if you can really internalize this shift. So that's, that's what we're doing. It's a really exciting journey. Um, I hope we can inspire the companies on the call today to really step it up and take it to the next level. But, uh, but I am being very honest. It takes the leadership and high-level management to really get this the way I get it, the way Eric gets it, the way Mark and Paul get it, for it to stick in your organization. That's what I would say. It, it's a phenomenal message. And obviously, it's a message that we've um, spread you know, for the past five, six years, I mean, my own experience is that if the leaders <clears throat> at a company just don't get it, um, then it's a struggle with the internal champions trying to do their best. Um, however, I, I did make a comment earlier on before we started that said, uh, if I'd have had the leadership influence of the people that I'm looking at now, um, 10 years ago, then it would have gone a long way to convince my leadership that this is the way of life. Um, we had a, a session in our consortium probably uh, at the beginning of the, the month. And, and I think it was Jim that said, I need, a, I need a vision, I need a mission or something like that. And I just out of the blue wrote a few words and I said, know the waste, see the waste, eliminate the waste, have fun. And it just came straight out. And to me, that's what life is all about. Because as you said, you know, you're not in the process of just making chairs, Ryan, you're in the process of improving the process of making chairs. And then everyone 
having fun doing it, which is really cool. You uh, you only used five minutes, by the way. So that was really cool. Okay. <laughs> All right, Paul, I'm going to keep you to last if I can, um, no because I've got one more uh, little video that I want to share with everybody. Um, and this is the other guest that couldn't make it. This is Rick, uh, but he has sent me a video. So uh, I haven't listened to it all. Just have a listen to Rick. Hey everyone, my name is Rick Black and I'm with ABR Wholesalers. We're, we're an HVAC distributor in upstate New York, 60 or so employees, three locations. Uh, we're not manufacturing, but we are distribution. And just like manufacturing, we have processes. Um, so Richard reached out and I'm honored to be included in this incredible lineup of, of people there. Um, I don't feel worthy, but I appreciate it very much. But we're all in this together and trying to improve. So what triggered myself and ABR wholesalers to pursue two second lane? Well, it was really started with my desire my desire to find a framework of how to improve. You know, it was just my curiosity of saying, you know, geez, how can, how can I help do what I do better? And I found the Toyota production system. And then I went into Six Sigma training. And then I found Paul Aker's Two Second Lean, which I think is, if you've read the book, you all know that he simplified lean through a great story of his company at FastCap. And it really, changes the game because it takes something complex like Six Sigma or even the Toyota production system and just simplifies it, right? Hey, any of us can make two second improvements every day with some education about lean, eight wastes, 3S, 5S, things like that, right? It does take some education. And that's part of the time commitment. Time commitment is critical. If you look at all these companies that are successful, with two second lean, it's the month, it's the morning meetings, and it's time commitment to improve. It's giving permission to your employees, first of all, to, to dedicate time to improving, and then through their education, documenting that improvement to inspire others. That is so important. We have a Teams channel here internally where we post improvements. And it, it goes up and down because we're not dedicated to the meeting of every day. You know, we're in the service industry, a little bit different than manufacturing. We have three locations and our staff, when they come to work, customers are already calling. So we've had a challenge dedicating that time for the meetings in the morning and also dedicated time for the whole company to come together and maybe 3S and go over these uh, processes and learn lean. So we've had to incorporate it into our daily work. It's been a struggle. I'm not going to say this is ever easy. That's why um, few companies hit the level of Paul and, and Ryan's companies. They're incredible, incredible examples of where lean can lead your organizations. But my recommendation is this, is that somebody in your company, hopefully at the top, meaning the ownership or CEO, wants lean to happen. Because that's, it takes somebody to make the decision. It takes someone to drive time commitments. All right. You know, I'm, I'm an executive in the company, but I'm not the ownership. So we're, we are struggling with that. If I were ownership of the company, yes, I might make some different decisions with Lean. I would put it as a higher priority and maybe make some sacrifices in order to dedicate that time to improve. Why? Because I know through going on the Japan study mission of, of being around these incredible people that have created the highest level of lean in their companies, that time commitment pays for itself. 10 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day. It's a dedicated time that'll make it happen. Now, if you're, if you're not ownership or top management, it can drive the entire organization, then your sphere of influence can make the difference. You know, make, you know, work with your own team, dedicate time, learn, do the daily meetings, daily stand ups, five minutes, 10 minutes, record those improvements, 
all these core things are real and they do and truly work and inspire others by having a channel with those videos of information that people can see and be inspired on. So that's my advice. Um, but the trigger is someone having the desire to improve and making it happen. All right. It does, it does take decision making and it takes follow up and it takes dedication. So it's my advice. I know you can do it. Uh, feel free to call me, email me, Rick Black at abrholesteelers.com. You know, we're all in this together in, in the community of lean to try to help each other improve. Um, that's part of the philosophy of Toyota, and I just absolutely love it. Um, it's Paul's philosophy. He's just a wonderful human being, uh, sharing all this, this his knowledge in, in lean and, and his methods, and it's, it's helped all of us. So, all right, thanks a lot. Appreciate it, and I'm honored to speak in front of you guys. Thanks a lot. So that was Rick. Rick is part of a WhatsApp group um, called Lean Maniacs, and um, he's he's struggling as well because he's not the the leader in the organization, and he's an executive, but he's got the same sort of issues that the rest of our consortia has. That there's always somebody higher that has to make a decision, um, albeit that Jim, you can make decisions, but you've just got to take that leap of faith, okay? And <laughs> somehow we're gonna get to it. So last but not least, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Paul. And um, I just wanna say, uh, Paul, I haven't read your book, but I've listened to it about a hundred times. <laughs> okay, I've got, I've got like, a play on my phone um, and uh, it's, it's incredible. So, I mean, you know me, it changed my life. Um, I'm, I'm getting over the hill, but um, it's just fantastic. So it's all yours, Paul. Share. Okay, so I've got my timer going here. So there you go. I've got my timers. I'm not going to go over. So the first question is, I want to do it succinctly, Richard. The first question was, what was the trigger, right? Right. Groundhog Day. So I got tired of waking up every day, walking into my plant, going through the plant and facing the same problems over and over and over again. And me being the one that was always having to solve the problems, everybody looked at me with this dumb stare like, well, uh, that's the way it is. I got tired of Groundhog Day. That was the first trigger. The second trigger was I'm an idiot. I went to Japan. I walked into Lexus. I looked at what they were doing. And I looked at what Lexus was doing, and I looked at what Paul Akers was doing, and I said there was no semblance. There was no, there was no correlation between the two. They were doing excellence. I was a firefighter. All I did was fight fires all day long. They had a smile on their face. And then, being an idiot, this was the next trigger. I would talk to the Japanese people, and, and I would say, you do this? And they would go, and they'd smile at me, go, yeah, 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 don't, don't you do this? And they would look at me like, are you really this stupid that you don't understand that continuous improvement will deliver this result? And they'd smile, yeah. And I'd go, I'm an idiot. It, it just became so clear to me, the trigger was that I was an idiot. And then I had no idea what I was doing and that what I was doing didn't work. And then the next thing is decision. Ryan said it. I cut off. I said, I'm done. I'm not doing it the old way anymore. It's over. Cut off. I'm going this way. I'm going to walk through fire. I'm going to walk on water. I don't care what I'm going to, I don't care what it takes, but I'm done. This is what happened to me. And then the more I gained clarity that I was never going to go back and never have the Japanese look at me and go, you're really this stupid. You don't, you don't get this. I was never going to have that feeling ever again. And I started realizing the benefits. 
So I started improving everything that I was doing. And then I started getting jacked up about it. I got felicity. I was happy about everything. And then my people started going, God, this is pretty cool. But then it didn't work like that, unfortunately. It wasn't enough that I was jacked up. I had to create a system where they could get jacked up every day. And that was by stopping work, by 3 sing every day, and by having a morning meeting. And I gave them time to get jacked up. I gave them time to feel like, hey, their life was improving, their work was improving, and the most important thing, that their ideas mattered. That the things that were bugging them bugged me enough that I allowed them to fix them. Not once, not once a week, not once a month, but every day and every second. That's all. There's no more to it than that. It's three minutes and 44 seconds. Okay. So you have to start somewhere. Okay. We've, we've got people in the organization that says, I believe in this. How am I going to show, inspire, convince other people in my organization that we're going to take this leap of faith and we're going to start our morning meeting we're going to know the wastes see the wastes eliminate the wastes and have fun yeah well here's the problem richard is everybody starts too big you know you're you're the ci manager you are you, you want to transform the whole company forget about transforming the whole company transform yourself you need to be changing every moment you need to be fixing all the clunky stupid processes that you're doing They're, you're surrounded by them i'm surrounded by them so if you start small by just fixing yourself and then your small sphere of influence the two or three people that you work with on a daily basis and you create synergy in the way you work and, and improvement in the way you work and people witness that, you know, think about what Mark said when Mark, Mark's people came to our facility, they saw what we were doing. When people see what you're doing and it's significant, it can't be just kind of okay. It can't be a poster on the wall. It's got to be remarkable. When it's remarkable, people have to go, what the hell is going on there? Like the Cambridge guys did, like Ryan did. What the hell is going on there? If your work is not invoking the response from people, what the hell is going on there? You are doing it right. That's all there is to it. I, I'm going to share a little story. Um, must have been seven, eight months ago. Paul and I were having a video call. I was sitting in my backyard. Paul was driving. And we were talking about a virtual session. Paul was going to do a leadership speech for AME. And I said to him, Paul, I need a description of what you're going to talk about so we can publish it on the website. He said, hang on a minute. And he pulled into a parking lot. And 15 seconds later, this description appeared on my phone. And I said, how the hell did you do that? He said, oh, I've got this really neat little thing with one word stuff. I've got 300 people a day asking me for stuff. Um, I just put in one word and it comes straight up and I just go share, boom, it's done. That is improving the processes that bug you every day. It's a great example. All right, I am gonna open it up to the consortia. I've got questions myself, but I want the consortia people to ask these four leaders in industry questions. Don't be shy, everybody unmute and ask away. I have a question for Eric. 
Okay. I'm just wondering when you, when you mentioned about, uh, you know, recognition of improvements, how do you do the recognition of your employees? Uh, similar to the gentleman on the video, we have a, a Teams feed. Uh, we stole that from Paul and Mark. Uh, we, so I ask everybody to shoot video of their improvements. They load them onto the feed and uh, at least every other day, but try to do it every day in a timely fashion. I refer to that email or refer to that post and I make sure I put the person's name in the post so they get an email letting them know that I am writing and recognizing them publicly for it. Um, we also have grateful shout outs in our morning meeting and we have a, a section of our morning meeting where we, we play those videos because not everybody uh, looks at the feed as, diligent, as, le as diligently as myself. So we try to surround everybody with that recognition. Okay, and then just a question for, for everybody here. At any point of time, is there any type of, shall you say, monetary recognition, gift cards, or is it all with the gratitude and the thanks? At Cambridge, it's all with gratitude, applause, and personalized thanks, and follow-up afterwards. We have never succeeded in trying to tie dollars and even, like, any kind of monetary small thing to improvements, uh, it's always landed in ruin. That was part of the 10 years of walking in the woods. Yeah, exact same at uh, Seaton Matters. We realized that people do more for appreci appreciation and recognition than they do for money. So yeah, same here. Thank you. Just a quick story. Uh, my son Noah is a is a bright young man, and he said the other day we were talking about continuous improvement because he knows two second lean. And he said it's not helpful for people to tell me that I'm smart. Um, it stops my creativity, um, but it's nice if they would tell me that I uh, did a good work. Uh, pro you know that I worked hard on it, and uh, you know he knows that. I know that uh, he knows that because it's the same thing as mon money. If you just give money, you're telling somebody that you, you're smart. You're, and it can stop the creativity. It's, it, uh, it doesn't work on a 17 year old or a, a 35 year old. I've got a question and, and it really kind of goes to a little bit about just your company. How do you guys, or are any of you guys handling uh, uh, multiple shifts where you've got multiple meetings to have every day and just how you're handling that? What do you do to, to, to keep that energy up when you get to that second shift or particularly if you've got a late shift? Does anybody work in multiple shifts? So we're continuously experimenting with this. Um, we had two separate meetings for two shifts. It wasn't great. COVID happened. We blew it apart into like four or five separate meetings with everybody distance. It was a mess. I pushed my team saying, we've got to get it back to one. At this point, we are doing one meeting at the end of first shift and the beginning of second. Um, and, that's, and, but that's, and that's the nature of this whole thing, right? So like, and six or nine months from now, I doubt we'll be doing what we're doing today. You got to keep moving the platform. So, uh, and I like what we're doing today better than what we were doing before, but it still needs help. We have two shifts as well. There are two separate meetings. Um, the first six months, we built the uh, primary meeting into something that was actually attractive. Uh, then we started recording that and sharing it with the second shift for the next six months until that sucked. And then they started to do it themselves and share the leadership. And today uh, they uh, have the exact same format, same, same uh, process, and they share leadership. The difference between first and second is we've got 160 people total, about 100 of them are on first shift and 60 on second. And so it's a smaller group and they, they all share leadership it's, it, and, uh, and they do it. So it's two times per day, same, same agenda. Same with us. At our other company, we started a company this year called Paragon Health. Uh, we have two shifts there, uh, 20 people each shift. And simply for the social distancing uh, reason, we done a start of shift for shift one, and start of shift meeting for shift two. So two meetings, both at the start of the shift for 15 minutes. Okay, just a follow on question from that then. So when you started your morning meetings, right? This was after you all had the aha moment. What was the format of your morning meeting when you started? And what has it transitioned to now? Each one of you answer that, please. 
Paul. So I was I, real quick. I was laughing because I don't remember what it was, but the word that came to mind was terrible. Right? Whatever it was, it was like it wasn't good because it was our first cut and it wasn't good. But it was great that we did it. And so uh, I, I can't even remember. And honestly, now it's too long. Like I, I don't, we don't have time for me to go into like all the stuff that we do in morning meeting: quality, safety, production, shipping, on and on, videos. And we're going to revamp it and retune it. Um, so just try anything and, and improve it from there. Paul? So w Richard, ask the question one more time. So when, when you had your aha moment, you're in Japan and you said, I'm going to stop. Right? So you pulled everybody together. What was the format of your initial morning meetings? And what has it transitioned into? Uh, okay. What have you transformed uh, I, it into? I, I, so the, the first morning meeting was simply opening up the book, Good to Great, and reading one page a day from it. And my wife was a good reader, so my wife did the reading, and then we talked about it. And then we went to work. That was it. It was so, again, back to my original statement, the problem is you're trying to change the whole company. You got to start really yeah. slow with everything you do. So that was our first morning meeting. And that worked. And then what happened was we went back to Japan and I worked with a company called Hawks and I saw what they were doing. This is the all time best uh, business book I've ever written as far as I'm concerned. And then we went back to Hawks in Japan and we saw what they were doing and they were doing stretching. You know, they, all the Japanese do these fun little stretching every morning and they were cleaning and they, they cleaned, they stretched, and they talked about their problems and any issues that were going on. And it was like five minutes long. It was a very short meeting. And I said, okay, so we're going to start doing that. So we started the stretching. We had the stretching in, and we started talking about our problems. And then before long, we started showing. Then we started walking from department to department, showing the improvements that people were making. Then our group got so big, we had 50 people the people in the back couldn't see so then we started making videos that's how the whole video thing came about so we started making videos and showing on a big screen tv i immediately mounted this one of my improvements put a big screen tv up so we could all stand around and watch the improvements that were happening in all the departments that's how the whole video thing came about if you didn't know how all that happened and uh, that's basically was the format of our meeting and today it's an outrageous college collegial level meeting, uh, studying history and the Constitution of the United States, Ono's principles, Deming's principles. Uh, it's the most outrageous meeting you could ever attend. It's unbelievable. And it's always changing. It's always improving. And you got to have your head screwed on straight to be a part of it. Awesome. <laughs> so, well, I think uh, since we went next after that, uh, so we went out and saw our two, two folks, three folks went out to see Paul's and came back and said, we have to start a hour long meeting. Everybody's <laughs> gotta be there. And they said, um, we're going yeah. to clean the bathrooms. And John Kramer's gonna clean the bathrooms and he has to clean the bathrooms. And we have to, it, it, that's the only way it works. And yeah. uh, I literally turned to the page where Paul says, start small and start where you have influence. And they did. And uh, uh, what we said was, will you guys commit to getting together on a daily basis? The three of you that are very impactfully by this thing. And they said, yeah, we're going to meet daily about this. Okay, great. Keep doing that. And then they started to bring in the people they had influence over. And they brought in another two people that were not there, but leaders there. And, uh, and then they started to bring in their teams. They had influence over about you know 50 people or whatever. So they started to bring in their teams and they committed to keep on going. And we said at the executive level, Kevin Thompson's a really bright, uh, reliable uh, CFO. And he said, if you start, you can't stop. So do not start big. So we were both aligned on that. Mm -hmm. They started small. We just attended and, and helped a little bit like, okay, are you keep on doing it? You're keeping on doing it? Yep, yep. And that's how it started. Um, it was catastrophically bad for a number of, of weeks, months. Um, when they brought it in, they were on break and uh, they would set it up and it was right after break and everybody had a, a soda and a candy bar and they all complained. Uh, at Paul's, they bring up challenges. And so all of them just started bringing up challenges, like complaints. And they were saying the lighting and the thing's bad and this is bad. And, and it was like, oh boy, this is bad. But they kept on doing it. And they were committed to figuring out how to build a, a morning meeting around growing people. And they just kept on doing it. And today, 5,000 people have come in to see this morning meeting. And that's what I'm inviting you to see. You have to see it. 
but it doesn't get built overnight and you had to, they had to commit to it and keep it going and starting small. Brian. Yeah, for us, uh, before Lane, we, we never actually had a meeting before. So it was a big thing for us to get everyone in the company in the one place. We, we'd never done that before. And, uh, we started very, very simply one, a four laminated page with four questions on it. Did we achieve our target? And nobody spoke. There was silence. People were so shy and backward because this whole idea of meetings was so abnormal. The next thing was, was there any defects from yesterday? And again, no one spoke. It was just a real awkward environment. But we just pushed through and kept persisting and persisting until some people started to speak and people got more comfortable with uh, speaking in a group. Then we just kept improving it every day and every week to what it is now. It's, uh, it's now a 25 minute meeting. Uh, it's really professional looking with slides and music and it's, it's like a full production every single day. And when people come for a tour of seating matters, they can't believe that we do this every day. It's like something that you would spend a month preparing but we have the, the process so dialed in that it's easy to prepare a good meeting. So uh, people really enjoy our meetings. And we always end our meeting uh, with something uh, positive. So it's all positive. Uh, gratitude, shout outs. It's all a positive ending to the meeting to give us a positive start to the day. So our, our meeting just keeps getting better and better all the time. So, yeah, it's really good. So... Um... Mark has already invited us to their morning meeting. Brian, yours would probably be about, must be 3 a.m. our time, maybe, or even 2 a.m. our time. <laughs> Eric, yours, yes. is, yours is okay. You're the same time zone as Mark, and yours is a little bit later, Paul. Um, would we be able to, I, I know, Paul, you've done a video or videos on how to conduct a morning meeting. It's on your website. Uh, has it improved since you did that video? Do you remember? Me? Every, everything in our company improves every day. It's nonstop improvement. The, video, the, the meetings are outrageous. And the, 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 the presentation quality of the people leading, because we have a new person lead, it just keeps getting better and better and better. The, the, the targets are so high. It's, it's staggering. The, the, it's, it's incredible. I don't so even it, know how to describe it. It's incredible. It, it, I sit there I, when I watch when I'm there and I go, I can't even believe what I'm watching. It's better than uh, it's better than a conference with thousands of people attending. It, it was uh, refreshing to hear that everybody's was a disaster to start with, though, um, because that that's exactly what um, our team are facing. And um, how long each? Just one word answers or two word answers. Uh, before they started to become um, meaningful and rewarding. Ryan, how long for you? One month, two months? I would say, to be honest, if I'm being honest, probably six months. Six months. Mark? Six, six months of doing it, yeah. Six, Mark. Month, six months with two months in, uh, had a shout out to Paul and said they're catastrophically bad. And he said back, he said to one of our guys, Keith, he said, keep going, you're doing it right. <laughs> Eric sounds like democracy it's messy uh I so two different organizations two different experiences um so I think here in St. Louis it was fast because we got to stand on on other people's shoulders so like a couple weeks in people were like we've been wanting this so that was great it's only a couple weeks Minnesota on and off like still working on it I would say that that like we're a couple years in and I'm like this is going to happen Okay. Awesome. That, that's good. The lessons learned. Okay. Uh, Paul, how long? Yeah, so I, 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 always tell, I always tell people that after three months, I finally started to see a little bit of progress. After six months, I was going, hey, this is working. Nine months, we were getting traction. Twelve months, everybody, everybody from all over the world, it seemed like, was coming to see what we were doing. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Um, next one, Puyan, any questions? Yeah, I got a question for uh, anyone who wants to answer, really. Um, our company is owned by a private equity, and they're very disconnected from manufacturing. They don't understand it. They just look at spreadsheets. And uh, our senior leadership team as well, Richard, I see you smirking there. Um, 
they are, again, also focused on the distribution side of the business, not really manufacturing. So our manufacturing, I always say we're on, a, on our own island and we kind of do what we do. And um, as long as we're profitable and nothing goes wrong, everyone's happy. So how do I, how do I make the SLT understand and see value in, in CI and two second lean? Um, and, and I've tried in the past and I've gone through, I think, you know, uh, right now I'm on my fifth uh, person I got to report to and they come and they go and they just, you know, one person thought it was a gimmick and, and the other ones just don't bother. I mean, I've, I've invited uh, my SLT to this uh, again at, at wrong timing because they are having board meetings, but how do I engage them? How do I, you know, get a win uh, with them? What do you recommend? Who wants to go? Well, well you, get a, you get a win by showing results. I mean, you don't need to talk. There's nothing to say to them. It's only to show them. Get, get results and they'll go, hey, this is incredible. This works. Yeah, I want to acknowledge you're, you're pushing in a really hard spot. Like that's a, I, I think what you've described is a very difficult situation, especially with the turnover. And you have people who are just looking at spreadsheets. I mean, that's largely what I described experiencing. Um, I think if I had to try to make that work, I would try to find one cell to start it in. A lot of what Mark was leaning on, like five people, 10 people who you can trust to really run it because there is the risk of a fall off in your labor efficiency. You're going to take people off the floor for half an hour. There's a risk there. Um, but if it's small enough in a big enough organization, it probably won't show up at first. So you can get it ripping for 90 days. And if that group can like a, like a, like a virus kind of like infect the rest of the facility, you will see very, very positive results and you won't even have to have a conversation. Um, I don't, I have no idea if that would work, but if I were in that spot, I was thinking about this before the meeting, that's what I'd try. I'd try to grab one cell and, and get it going. Perfect. It's perfect advice. That's exactly what you should do. Okay, thank you. A any, any further comments from Ryan or Mark? I mean, I, I think the, the reality is, is that lean transformational leadership requires long-term thinking. And so if you are not owned or managed or led by a, a person who cares about the long term, and if they're only looking short, short term goals as, as their only method, you know, I, I think expose them, uh, but don't count on them changing. And, um, so I, I decided that I, I moved because I was, I, I wanted a longer term uh, thinking uh, ownership structure. I want to comment on what Mark just said. The laws of nature suggest that if you're continuously improving as a human being, as a leader, that you're going to be elevated. Remember what I just said. The laws of nature suggest that if you are continually improving as a leader and as a human being, you will be elevated. So all these people that are frustrated because they're locked in middle management, I got news for you. I used to be there too. I'm not there. I'm the leader. I'm the one making the decisions. And that's not by accident. You can be that person too. But you need to be committed to the development of yourself on a daily basis through a rigorous process, through rigorous habits. And you will be the person leading the company. You will be the senior leadership team. And you won't have to deal with this nonsense. So I got a question, Puyam, for you with everybody listening. Uh, I know your business. Uh, I know it quite well. If you were to uh, stop production every day at 7.30 a.m., have your morning meeting with everyone, and then give them 30 minutes lean and clean, what would be the productivity results in your opinion? And you got Randy with you as well to support. What do you think? Well, I mean, I, I think it'll improve. We, we've, uh, uh, Fred and I have already um, started that, you know, in different work cells where 
we as a team, our 5S steering committee, we all go to a different work cell, stop work for half an hour, and we just observe, and then we take notes and say, okay, what are we going to go back to improve based on an easy, medium, and hard level? Um, it works, but the, the, the challenge there that I have is when you're doing um, stuff for people, you know, you're, you're trying to push them or pull them with you and, and help them out. But if you're not doing it yourself, if you're the owner of that group and you're not doing it yourself and someone else is doing it for you, I just feel like it doesn't stick. You can fall off again because you, you didn't own it. And we see that and we see some of it um, um, stick. But, you know, we, we, um, we changed the process in one of our sales and, um, you know, it was there for a month and I was just walking by the other day on my uh, Yemba walk and I noticed everything was put back to the original spot. So, and without anyone, you know, they made their own decision, which is fine. We want to empower them to do that. But uh, to me, it was, okay, well, why are you going back to the, to the old or the wrong way where we try to show you what the improvement was. And, and that's some of the challenges we're seeing right now. That's because you pushed it on them. You need to pull it from them. They need to come up with all these ideas. As long as you're coming up with the ideas, it's not going to stick. You're going to, you're going to always be in that cycle. They've got to come up with the ideas. Yep. I agree. Yep. Okay. Uh, Jim questions. Um, so right now our, our business, obviously um, in the uh, supplying the aircraft industry is hurting. Um, it, it's a very difficult time for us right now. I'm, I'm going to start this and I keep saying that, but I'm going to start this. I'm going to go take that bold step that you guys have all done. And I'm going to uh, uh, take some time to fail and learn and do it better. And then I want, I want it to be embraced. And I want, as you said, the ideas to come from the floor. I want them to make the change. And I just want to cheerlead uh, going forward. But I guess my, my worry right now is uh, we're on a, a reduced work week because of our business situation with the industry. Um, how like, you guys have all probably been through downturns. How have you guys managed your uh, employee expectations? How, how did you empathize with them and in, in, in that situation through those downtimes? I know this is going to help towards improving things, but it, uh, it, I've got to bring them along and get them engaged when they are, working reduced week work week because of it. So I don't know if that makes sense. I'm going to take that. I'm going to take that answer first. Okay. It's real simple survival. You have to, your people need to understand that the reason you're doing lean is survival. You want to, if you don't do lean, you're not going to survive. This is what I learned in Japan. You know, they, they, they adopt this model because they want to put food on the table. They want to be able to feed their family. They want to be able to know their grandchildren have a job. And if you're in a downturn, and this is what I did to my company when we were when we had struggle, we struggled. I said, if we don't do this, if we don't come together, we're not going to survive. We're going to have jobs. You're not going to be able to put gas in your car. I mean, we have to do this. We have to pull together. We have to figure this out. That, that's Thank my you. take. Mark, Ryan, Eric. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that we've shared in Cambridge is it's actually harder when you don't have a burning platform to uh, put this kind of uh, transformational leadership in place. And so, Jim, you've got a massive burning platform in, in front of you. And so um, it's now or never. It's like, let's do this thing. The part that I think is powerful, powerful at Cambridge is we like we have uh, we, we're having a hard year, and uh, COVID is not an easy year to lead through manufacturing. Uh, if anybody uh, knows that, um, but the the we've never like when we're thinking about reducing cash consequence, when we're thinking about conservation of cash for the liquidity of the business and survival. We've never once heard from any single individual, maybe we could take out the 30 minutes a day. Like, it is not even like, what are you talking about? That's the time we have to use to solve the problems that we're facing right now as a business. Mm -hmm. There you go. So no one comes up with that idea. Exactly. But, but that took five years. 
to get that so in line that the catastrophic failure comes and we're like, no. And so that's the conviction, Jim, if I came in, here's the problem you have. You've got a big freaking problem and you have to have the right team around it at the right frequency working on solving it. And they're going to need probably more than 30 minutes a day to solve it. So go to work on it. And you've got a great platform, great platform to do that with. Thank you. I, I would say there that uh, we were actually talking about this recently. Our company and, and uh, myself and my two brothers, we actually perform better on a downturn. And I think the reason is that we're more focused. And our team is more focused. And this year has been a really challenging year for us, but we've probably performed better than we did any other year. Because we have to think even more. We have to tap into everyone's creativity even more. We have to cost, cost, you know, we have to do cost reduction exercises even more. And it takes, you know, instead of three or four people leading the company, we have 50. We have 50 people thinking. We have 50 creative thinkers. We have 50 people helping us to focus and get through this. So I think on a downturn, it's actually, in some ways, more motivating and it's actually easier to improve and it's a time when everything should really be amplified and increased and stepped up that's how we look at it thank you ryan awesome awesome eric yeah i think what what comes to my mind is a sense of uh in these challenging times and we're going through this ourselves to you know engagement care and transparency Right. These are all, you know, those are kind of like the three big pieces in my mind, like you and they have to work in both directions. Like you need each individual on your team to be engaged, to care about the business and to be sharing what their challenges are, especially in this with the virus and like what they can and can't do. And then they need to feel that the company is engaged in their well-being, is transparent. They know what's coming and and that the company cares about them. And those are almost separate from the that that's almost a separate beast from the the two second lean and i think two second lean is a great platform to launch and be able to at least communicate from the business's direction to the people we care about you we're engaged in your well-being we need you to be engaged i think it it, it is a it's the platform to help have that conversation but i think that's that's what we seek in this in these more trying times and and they are trying times absolutely uh any any more questions from the group? I've got a couple, but just want some more questions. Yeah, actually, I do. Um, so a lot of our employees at Club Coffee, you know, they do see the opportunities to make improvements. Um, one, they've they now believe that improvements are generated now by the CI department, which is a challenge in itself. Um, but a lot of employees come forward with ideas that could cost money. And maybe it's not, you know, five bucks, you know, maybe it's thousands or tens of thousands. How do we handle that type of, um, uh, you know, improvements or thoughts without discouraging them? Well, we spend the money. I mean, we spend the money. We say no. <laughs> we, we say no, think we say no. Your problem's too big, concentrate on something smaller and we'll get there. It'll take us a little longer, take us like three months and six months, but like, let's, let's pull the scope down. We understand your struggle. Like let's build around that. We don't have the money today. And I, I share that uh, money flows to people that are solving problems with their ingenuity and the, the geniuses at the work level. And I point to the page in uh, Two Second Lean that shares that uh, money stifles creativity. So mm -hmm. what are our creative solutions that could come up with a solution? It's, it, is, it takes uh, more leadership and more intelligence and more creativity to come up with the solution to the problem without money. But money flows still to the people that are solving problems. So it's not that we don't spend it. It just comes after you are solving things without it. I'll give you an example of that. So um, we had a, a video come up about a year into the, the time and uh, a guy, person on the floor had taken a, a um, laminated sticker that was too long for the box that they were putting it on. And they had created a very fast way to cut the 
um, cut the label off, a laser blade, and, razor blade, and a little jig to cut it off. So it only took them a couple seconds each time. And they played that for the whole company. And the engineers are watching that and they're like, why wouldn't they come to us, the engineers, to solve that for them? And they said, that's been on your list for five years. Yeah. Five engineers represent the money that you would have to spend to do it. Guess how long it took to solve the problem with the engineers after the person did the improvement? Zero. It, it, it was like that day. They just went, okay, let's just fix it. And so the money, the engineering resources flowed to the person who showed the ingenuity and the, the creativity to cut the freaking thing off and make it with the solutions that they had with at their disposal. And it always, that is a natural law of, uh, that, that's the same thing that Paul said. You know, it's the natural law that if you improve yourself all the time, how much did you grow this year? How, how much percentage wise did you as a leader grow this year through the improvements that you made for yourself? on yourself. And, and if it happens, money will flow to you and you will get promoted into more influential positions. It just does. It's the natural laws and it's, it's just a natural law. So when I say we spend the money, our people make tens of thousands of improvements, tens of thousands. I mean, there's so many improvements. I, my head even spins. I can't even keep up with them. And so when they need new forklifts, we just went to new stand-up forklifts. We spent $80,000. It was like done done we need a new three quarter of a million dollar digital pretty machine done but that's all backed up by tens of thousands of small improvements that cost next to nothing we have the money to do whatever we want to do because yeah. you've saved it and i i'm being too i'm trying to be too pithy too uh but i but i will say you know we, we aren't in a position to spend all, all those dollars um but we don't simply say no right we acknowledge that they're seeing waste and we <laughs> congratulate them for that and like as leaders, we say that is an awesome job identifying the stuff that's bothering you and that there's waste there and that's painful. And let's work together to make a less painful system, right? So we bring them in and we say, okay, we don't have the dollars to buy the forklift and the digital printer today, but what are we going to do to make your job a little bit easier tomorrow? And people can get pretty fired up about that. You can knock it out in a day, two days, shoot a video and have people celebrating something that isn't that big an investment and hope for the future for the, the improvement on the Okay. This, this might sound, uh, this, this might sound a bit the, the opposite of what most people would say, but I actually encourage people to spend money. Um, I'll give you an example. We had an example uh, a, a few weeks ago where there's a part in our chair where we have to bend 19 millimeter tube. And we made this manual bender and we were pulling it by hand and it was doing a good job, but there was a lot of struggle. And the guys were standing around thinking, how can, how can we improve it? Maybe we can put a, a motorized ram on it or an air cylinder and all this type of stuff. And I said, we need a pipe bender. We need to go straight to the top. Cut out all the steps. Get the freaking pipe bender. Let's get it ordered today. The pipe bender was £6,000. We ordered it that day. It came a week later. Now we're bending the pipe in half the time. So sometimes hey. you can be in too close to the problem when you need to go straight to the machine. Amen. Spend the money. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Yeah, but that, that's five years later when you've already saved millions and millions of dollars because everybody's done these hundreds of thousands of two second lean improvements. So yeah, to, it, to it, put, it's a yes and answer. All of that is a yes and answer. Yeah. So so to put Tanya's question in perspective, because I've I've come from many, many organizations that have suggestion schemes which don't work, right? Um, the, the problem is that the people at Club Coffee, when they're talking about an improvement, they're not seeing the two second improvements. They don't see those because they're not recognizing the waste. They but see that's where you gotta big, start. the big stuff. So, but that, but that's know, where you got to start. You got to start yeah, with the little stuff. You got to start by getting them to see the waste. Why are you doing it like this? Okay. Uh, have a think about it. Is there any other quicker way that we can do it? Is it easier for you? So uh, here's, here's the next question. Um, some companies don't allow video and cell phones in the business. One of the big uh, proponents of sharing and learning is watching the videos. What would you suggest to the companies right now that have this archaic policy of not allowing people to use their cell phones. 
Well, I, I can take that because we used to do that. Before lean, nobody was allowed their phone. They had to put it in the kitchen. But we asked, why? Why why are they not allowed their phones? And when we got to the source of the problem, the why was that we didn't trust our people to there have their go. phones in case they would be on social media or Facebook. You need to get rid of the... the you need to sort out the trust problem. You need to go right to the source, get rid of that, and allow them to have their phones. That's what I think. Okay, Mark, because I know you, you've got like company phones around the place, or you used to. Yeah, we still do. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, so it's risky to allow people uh, to make improvements. It's risky to allow them to take video. It's risky, it's scary. The other word is it's scary. And so um, the, the question I, for me, you have to admit that you're scared. The leader that's trying to set that policy in place, they need to admit that they're scared because they're scared. And then they need to have a coach with them that can get them over that. Paul was our coach for that. Um, he got us over that. And, um, and then you have to follow the advice of the coach instead of your own damn thinking because your own thinking has gotten you where you have gotten to. And uh, so you need to listen to other people and follow their advice. And, uh, but you got to get to the right person who's actually making the decision, who's scared. And uh, so whoever's that, whoever's that decision maker has to be the one that gets the coaching and admit they're stuck. Yeah, the word I like is trust. Absolutely. You got to trust your people. Absolutely. And that, there'll be the 10, 80, 10 rule. 10% uh, of them are going to be passionate and follow you off the end of the cliff. 80% will sit on the fence and see which way the wind blows. And 10% of them will be totally negative to what you want to do. So work with the 10% passionate and hopefully become 20 and then 30 and 40 and the negative ones will leave. And then you trust everyone, right? Because we're all individuals. I'm a job relations trainer and everyone is an individual. H how do you manage it, Eric? Cell phone usage. Um, I don't think we have like a tight enforcement on using a phone or not using a phone, but we do supply uh, iPads and have like a couple available across the company. It is a, it's a point of weakness right now and something we're improving on. Um, okay, but, just, but just further to that then. Yeah, further to that, the, the videos that are taken, how do you manage them? Where do you store them? Because obviously you could have sensitive um data in the backgrounds of these videos that you take and especially in the aerospace industry and stuff like that how do you securely store these videos so that you can uh, access them really quickly at your morning meetings brian so we oh, this, Eric, this is an answer that might not be helpful for a number of folks but like we have come to terms with the fact that we're in an industry where our secrets aren't that secret we would like to believe that proprietary information is incredibly valuable, but it's just not. Like I've slowly convinced myself and my team has helped convince me and we've gotten our heads around this idea. Like we're bending pipe and painting metal <laughs> hundreds of years. Like, and, and the thing I love the most about this whole, this thumbprint, right? Lean, the lean journey is a thumbprint. So like I can bring you into my shop and you can spend a full week there and you can write down every detail of everything we do to say nothing of a video. And I am completely comfortable with you going back and trying to implement that because it will be exceedingly difficult for you to get to where we are. Okay, I wanna make a comment about this because this is very, very interesting. So look, about, look at us, look how public we are. We've got thousands of videos that are, show, that thousands of videos that are online that everybody sees what we're doing, right? And it's actually a competitive advantage, okay? Are you ready for this, you guys? You're not gonna believe what I'm gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> it, I don't have any competition. Did you hear what I just said? I don't have any competition. Yeah. Do you know why? You know why I don't have any competition? Because you're so far ahead of everyone. Because I scare the hell out of my competition. Nobody wants to compete with me. Do you want to try to compete with me? Do you want to try to compete with getting 50 people engaged 100% every day and making thousands of improvements? The answer is hell no. It's actually a weapon, a strategic weapon to show people what you're doing. I, I think Ryan's shop is the better example. 
because like the Mark and Paul and I are, and I would argue we're in more obscure industries, but there are thousands of people making chairs in every type of country with every type of cost base. And I look at some of his videos and like, you just can't do it. You just can't go from making the chair the way you're making it today to the way Ryan's team is doing it. It just doesn't. Now, aer aerospace may be more sensitive. I understand there's other stuff there. Maybe there's government. Uh, that's a different compliance issue. Yeah, I think the, uh, the I mean, this has been a major change for us. Um, privately held family business, no sharing transparency of any kind of any financials or information. And when I got there 12 and a half years ago, the only conversation in the marketing means was what our competition was doing. And um, they were trying to copy us. And so we would just talk about how bad they were about trying to copy us. We don't talk about our competition at all. There's no, <laughs> word, no discussions. There is, Good. We, look, we look forward. Good. We march towards purpose. And uh, that is all about growing our company. And that growth of our company is based on growing our people. And two second lean is foundational for our ability to grow our people and our competition. I love whenever they mimic, it's so flattering. It's awesome. <laughs> but that's, that's, you know, if you're going to grow hiding is not a growth uh, characteristic. Now I, I, I agree. Um, 30 years ago when I was uh, in aerospace, I used to be the person taking people around our plant. And, and I used to say, I don't care who comes in. Competition can come in because what are they gonna do? They're gonna see something, right? They're gonna see a board. They have no idea what the process is underneath. They have no idea how the people are interacting every day. By the time they've implemented something and failed, we'll be five years ahead of them anyway. So that was, that was my philosophy on life, especially when it comes to um, sharing stuff that might be a competitive advantage. But here's the question. You, all the videos you take, where do you store them? Where do you put them? Well, put two them things. Away. Say again. Paul, where do you put yours? Well, well, first of all, we've made we made some mistakes on this. So this is what I would tell you to do. We put everything in YouTube. We upload everything to YouTube. Thousands and thousands of videos. Who knows? God, there's so many videos there. It's crazy. But what we do now is we upload them to YouTube, which is a new platform coming out called Rumble, which we're switching over to because I hate YouTube. I hate the censorship and all the other crap that's going on there. But we everything to YouTube. And now we're down, we're making sure we save a copy of everything on a hard drive, which we weren't doing. So we've actually got our, our, our person to go in and download every video we've ever made and put it on a hard drive because we're afraid that YouTube is going to cancel our account, it's gonna take us off, gonna wipe out that entire uh, history and, and learning center that we've created. So okay. two places. Okay, Ryan? Yeah, for us, our day-to-day uh, -day improvements are just on WhatsApp, on our WhatsApp group. Um, our training and standard work videos are on a private YouTube channel, so no one else can see them unless you have the link. Okay. And uh, then, obviously, our marketing customer-facing videos are on YouTube. Okay. Mark? Because we started before WhatsApp was really um, well instituted, we use YouTube uh, unlisted like uh, Ryan's group. And then we have a public channel that is um, that is where we either will share some of the larger improvements or any of our public facing items. But we have 8,000 videos in a private unlisted YouTube channel. I would, if I did it again, I would not use YouTube. I would use WhatsApp, but it's still, it is still owned by, you know, it's, it's still not your content. Um, and so we, yeah. yeah, so we, we, we pull down anything that's important. We do not pull down all of our improvement videos. Those are for flow that just moves. And the, the key part for us is to appreciate the person and then move forward. But when we make a video that captures a larger improvement or tells a story and people put time into it, that's above and beyond the improvement, then we, then we capture it in a separate uh, channel. Yeah. Eric, what, what, I and over. Where do you so put we're, uh, we're surprisingly dedicated Microsoft shops. So we have, I didn't expect that to happen, but it's just the, where we've flowed to. We use Microsoft Streams and Microsoft Teams to share and it does a fine job. Like it's not, it's not brilliant. It's probably not as convenient as YouTube, 
but it's uh, it's good okay. enough. It pains me to say that. Yeah. Do you have a an Anova channel on YouTube that anybody I can do? Subscribe? I was pressured to do that by a friend of mine on this shot. <laughs> It's there. We've loaded video to make people know that we exist and we care, um, but it's not, it, we don't, we don't feed it on a regular basis. I mean, it, the whole thing to me about having a record of these improvements is the word inspire. It, 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 you look at these things and think, well, somebody's done this. They feel great. It saved them some time. It saved them some grievance and it inspires other people to go and do the same thing so the the fact uh i'll be honest with you paul's and ryan's uh youtube channels i i must have shared those so many times with so many people and the whatsapp groups that i'm on these little videos that keep coming through boy i just forward them to my consortia straight away if that doesn't inspire them i'm not sure what will, but I'm still waiting for the, what is it called? Reciprocity or whatever it is, the reciprocity. Reciprocal. reciprocity. I want the reciprocal. I want my consortia to start sharing improvements of their own. So if you've got a no cell phone policy, okay, put a hood on, um, do it <laughs> whenever you can, go anonymous, but start sharing this stuff. Yes, Jim, you've got another question. Sorry, yeah. Um, with the uh, the COVID situation, the social distancing, we have um, uh, we like to call it the home team. People that actually work remotely that are able to. Obviously, I can't bring the machines home, but how do you uh, handle keeping them connected? And if you have the same kind of situation, and for your morning meetings and that, are you streaming them in some manner? Mark first. Yeah. Yeah, so we shut down the plant for one week. Uh, we shut down our morning meeting for one weekend. We didn't miss a single day, but we took it from 160 people in person to all virtual uh, on Monday when we brought it back up. Right now, it's high. It, we moved it quickly to hybrid, which is basically we've got people that are working in the plant, which is about you know 70, and then we've got the rest of them working from home, and it's a hybrid meeting. So whoever's there has. Uh, socially distanced locations with TVs that are there and uh, and can hear and audio is there and and then people that are on their Zoom like we are are talking through through this. Um, it is not easy, uh, but it was critical. It's mission critical, and so we put the time and attention into making sure that it was up and running quickly. We needed it. Thank you, Paul. Paul, uh, ask the question one more time. I'm, I'm six years old. I don't remember stuff that well. <laughs> yes, still you. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, so we, we're in this COVID situation, we're, we've got a situation where I've got people working remotely. And um, your morning, I don't know if you have that same situation. Um, your morning meeting, are you streaming it? Um, are they joining it remotely? No. How do you no. keep them connected? Or we only had we only had one person, if I recall, that was working remotely. He okay. worked in Canada and he couldn't get across the border. And no, he was not engaged in the morning meeting. And I wasn't overly concerned about it. But okay. uh, that's the only problem. That's the only. We, we, we when the COVID thing happened, to be honest with you, I mean, we did the compliance to comply with the comp with the government and all the other nonsense that was going on. But in large measure, our company didn't miss a beat. We just kept cranking. Not we didn't miss a beat through the whole thing. All right, thank you. We have gone to Zoom um, and streaming, similar to what Mark's describing. Okay. Ryan, um, the way of everyone back at work, we're working from home for a few weeks, but everyone's back and back to the normal morning meeting. Okay. Still back to normal, yeah. Thank you. Okay. A any other questions from anyone? Let me just offer, Jim, if you if you want to talk to anybody on our team about like the nuts and bolts of how we're getting that done, just hit me, hit me up. We're happy to Howard, share. Appreciate that, Eric. Thank you. Yeah, Eric, just put your email into the chat and then they can email you directly. Questions? Anybody else? 
No, Kroom, you've been very quiet. No questions? Uh, I have a couple of comments. Just want to reflect on uh, Paul's comment about ideas. It's, I mean, thank you first to the whole panel of discussion and sharing knowledge and which is also ideas, right? And Paul commented about ideas and uh, Paul, you mentioned about it needs to be their ideas, which is the key of success. I think it's it, it's a key was it's that combines everything and trust and the whole success. And we're talking about lean and at the end of the day, everyone is capable. It's it's everything is in our heads, like everything is psychology, how to succeed. It's more about psychology versus am I capable or not? And back to the ideas, it's long time ago, I, I read, you know, it's a, just a statement which kind of drives me since then and I repeat it to myself on a daily basis that everyone that you will meet today and talk to somebody, that person will know something that you don't know. It could be about cooking, it could be about how to do something, but everyone in your life knows something that you don't know. And that's the key how we're developing ourselves, like how to reflect from others' knowledge and gain that knowledge to implement it. And for us, like leaders and middle management or senior management of the company, owners and stuff like that, it's more about uh, engaging our teams. And sometimes it's the, the, the skills, how to do that reverse psychology that even if we have an ideas, to pause and try to trick our employees that it's their ideas. Try to get them into that trap that at the end of the day it's to get them that it's my idea. And it's not everybody will know, you know, to have some ideas, but how to sell our ideas that kind of to lead them that they will come with an idea that say, this is the idea. Sometimes people will have, and it's a, you know, it's a personality and they will be open and some people will not even stop with ideas, but you know, there's also the hidden talent of people that are shy and how to predisposition them to get into it. And sometimes we need to guide them a little bit because it's knowledge is knowledge and they may not materialize, but the key element is that I wanted to say that it's everyone has, everyone knows something that we don't know and how to get that to the surface. And it's a key for us as a leaders to guide our employees in that direction. It's, and, uh, that's what I wanted to say. And also thank you for everybody for their sharing knowledge. It's, it's really interesting what you just mentioned, Kroom, because I'm sure if we asked uh, four um, experts, they will have had employees within their own organization that probably at the beginning just didn't get it. Okay. And, you know, as a, a leader, as a coach, then you've got to make that um, decision, you know, how long do I work with this person? How do I long do I work with these people to help them to understand? Because you're absolutely right. People don't know what they don't know. And, you know, asking them to stop their traditional um, clocking in, I'm going to work my eight hour shift. I'm going to go home. Just leave me alone. Let me do a good job. Now you actually want me to think about improvement. Oh my gosh. Well, you're a manager, you get paid to improve stuff. I just get paid to make this bit every day. Um, so it's, it's really interesting what you, what you say, Kroom, that you know, with, when you've got 50 people, it's probably easier than 500 people. Um, it's, uh, it's just about leadership and leading. And I think the message that we've got strongly today is that as a, as a mid manager, you got to start and fix what bugs you. Fix what bugs you and then start to show people what you've done and bring in the people that you can influence and get them to start doing it every single day as well. So it's, it's not easy. Everybody here on the call this morning has said it's hard. Uh, Ryan emphasized it's really hard because you got to keep doing it every single day. Um, you get to the point though where you're at the top of the hill and it's just downhill from then on because 
everyone else is just pulling you along. Okay. And it's like in the crisis, I've heard that a couple of times, not one person has said, let's stop this 30 minutes of lean and clean because we've got a crisis, because that's what's going to help us through it. We get a chance to solve the problems. So it's, it's 1141 Eastern daylight savings time. I've just got one more little thing. I'd like to get some comments from the team. 30 minutes lean and clean. Traditionally, the world knows that workplace organization is 5S. And we all know it's sort, set in order, shine, standardize, sustain. Paul has reduced it to 3S, which essentially is sweep, standardize, sweep, sort, and standardize. Correct, Paul? That's correct. And it isn't me. I learned it from Hawks. I learned it from the Japanese. Yeah, we learn it. That's what we're doing. We share learning and growing. So, um, yes, I know where ESCO has got 6S because they think that it's five plus safety. But guess what? If you do sweep, if you do standardize, um, sorry, if you do sweep and you do sort and you do standardize, you're going to make the place safe anyway. Safety is a byproduct. It is. It is. It's the result. So um, we're going to start. I got a company. My very first session is going to be Monday. And I'm going to tell everybody, you're going to do 30 minutes lean and clean. It's actually clean and lean because you're doing the cleaning first. Um, how do you get everybody to start? What do you tell them to do? Who wants to take this one up first? I think the, the first thing is to uh, is for everyone to understand why. If we start with why we're doing it, it's easy to figure out the how. So it takes a lot of discipline to do the, the morning meeting and the approving time every day. But you actually don't need discipline when you've got knowledge. So if you've there got you the go. knowledge of why, <laughs> you've got the knowledge of why we're doing improvement time, you don't need the discipline. So if you get everyone to the point of why we're doing this, they believe in the process, then I think it'll be easy. Okay, Eric. Yeah, I think I think Ryan absolutely nailed it. Um, if you, I, I can't really imagine. Here's this half hour. We're going to cut everybody loose, and then like, what do you tell people to do first thing? Like, push this broom, wipe this down. Like, that's not it, right? If if we're having to do that, we've missed entirely, right? You've got to have people trained enough to say like, here are the three S's. We can all agree we want to live and work in a clean environment. Like, let's start with that. And if we have to have a conversation about, well, I don't really need this environment clean, let's have that conversation before we ask, give people half an hour to go lead and clean. Um, so there's, yeah, there's knowledge and building and investment in people before you even, you can't tell them what to do anymore. You got to get them smart and then let them do, let them do the work. Maybe not smart, Mark, yeah. Mark, can you repeat the question? So I'm going, to start, I'm going to start Monday. All right. I've never done this before. I'm going to stop everybody doing their job for 30 minutes. And I'm going to ask them clean and lean. We're going to do three S. Where would I start? What do I tell them? Well, I, I think we already answered it, but I'll repeat it, which is start small in something that you can actually control. So if you are the owner, CEO like Ryan is, and you can come in and say, we're converting. Or if you're the owner, like Paul is, you can say, stop here and move there. But if you are leading a team, you start with yourself and anybody that's willing to meet with you. And you see if you can hold that, hold it, hold it for a long enough time that you can actually be continuing to do it. And then see if you can invite and influence other people to do it. Um, I, I love, you know, with a small group, reading the book together, one page at a time, one chapter at a time, and talking about it. And then see if you guys would go, what's next? 
it doesn't have to look the same everywhere. It's not about the same. You have to build passion in your leadership to carry whatever obstacle is, is uh, in front of you and bust it down. So start small, keep moving. That's what I got. Okay. Paul, final words. Do you brush your teeth every morning? Do you comb your hair every morning? Do you wash your clothes? It's the same concept. There are basic things that need to be done every day before you start the day. That's all we're doing. We sweep the floor, we empty the trash cans, we clean the desk, we clean off the clutter. This is brushing your teeth, washing your clothes, taking a shower. That's all it is. It's this basic routine of things that need to be done to set an order so you have a good day. And the, the, the sorting is obviously getting rid of stuff that doesn't need it to be there, which right. is very simple, right? So then you work with the stuff that is necessary and you standardize it. You put it in a place and, and you do it so that retrieval is super simple. Right. So, I, Richard, I actually didn't answer the question correctly. The real reason you 3S is to find problems. We're just cleaning and polishing. We're just sorting crap out so we can find problems, so we can fix them. That's the only reason we're 3Sing. We're looking for problems. I'd like to say that I, I pulled up a document and I think I can pull it up pretty quickly. Yeah, here it is. It's from my CFO. And uh, my CFO only works four days a week and we do tens of millions of dollars of business around the world in 40 countries. So put your head around that one. So our finance, we have no financial department, but we have a CFO that manages our, our finance part of it. it, gives analysis for me every month and only works four days a month. We have no financial department, okay, none. Tens of millions of dollars all over the world. This is what he wrote in the summary for last week, okay? One of the keys to the success is the proactive approach this company has towards problems. Where most companies don't face their problems, you run to them and solve them immediately. Yeah, end the story. End the story. Awesome. What a, what a, a line to finish up on. Um, Tanya, have you got one more question? What happens if people goof off in the half hour? <laughs> you got the wrong people and you need to train them. First, you need to train them. If they don't, if you can't train that out of them, you need to get rid of them. Yeah. It, it's, there's, it's, no, there's no, there's no, there's no, there's that's completely the wrong attitude. And, and just remember everyone, that culture is the result of the behaviors of leadership. Absolutely it is. Nothing else, right? So if, if you've got a bad culture, you've got bad leaders. Simple as that. Anyway, any more questions from the group? Um, we, we're close to 10 minutes to midday Eastern time. Um, no more questions. I'd like to, from my heart, thank Paul and Mark and Eric and Ryan and Rick from obviously his video. Um, but what you've done this morning, it, it is absolutely phenomenal. Ryan, the fact that you gave up your time taking your wife to the hospital is unbelievable um, that you would dedicate your time to sharing your story with us. Um, and on behalf of AME, the Association for Manufacturing Excellence and Share, Learn and Grow um, and our consortium, the AME Lake Ontario Consortium, I wanna thank everyone for the contribution today. I think it's been truly valuable. I hope and pray that it will inspire um, our consortium leaders to take that leap of faith. Uh, I certainly do. So on behalf of everyone, thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right, thanks for- Thank you. Thank you, thanks very much. All right, I'm gonna stop recording. <laughs>